Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear guests, uh, dear friends of American University of Kiev, dear students and faculty members. Uh, welcome to our uh, first AUK Talks uh, session for, for this year, for 2024. Uh, we are well into our second year of uh, conducting those uh, talks, those online seminars. As you know, by now they have become the uh, primary or the main venue, uh, preeminent venue for uh, bringing together really the, the global leaders um, uh, in, uh, in the spheres of diplomacy, international politics, the military, uh, international law, academia, uh, think tanks. Uh, so tonight we're extremely um, privileged to have with us Ambassador uh, Stephen Rapp, who is the former uh, U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice and a former international prosecutor uh, at the tri tribunals for Rwanda and Sierra Leone. Um, Ambassador Rapp will talk to us about the necessity of justice uh, for Russia's crimes against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, you have, I believe you have all seen... Um, uh, Ambassador Rapp's uh, bio. Um, he's an ex extremely accomplished uh, uh, American uh, lawyer who has worked at, uh, across uh, really most of the countries, uh, most of the regions in the world and the dozens of countries um, on uh, at, at the highest levels of international justice. Um, so let me just remind you that um, Ambassador Rapp is the chair of the Board of Commission on International Justice and Accountability. He's also senior visiting fellow of practice with the Blavatnik School for uh, Ethics, Law, and Arm Armed Conflicts Program on International Peace and Security. Um, so um, Ambassador uh, Rapp served as the U.S. Ambassador to um, at large for war crimes between uh, 2009 and 2015. Uh, he was heading the Office of Global Criminal Justice uh, at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, prior to his appointment, he served as the prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone beginning in uh, 2007, and he was leading the prosecutions, actually, of former uh, Liberian President Charles Taylor um, and others who uh, uh, were accused of uh, the atrocities commit committed during the civil war in Sierra Leone. Um, Basu Rapp just uh, uh, mentioned earlier that um, he's uh, planning another trip to, to Africa, I believe, in, in, in regard to uh, to this case and these uh, uh, these uh, events, um, the uh, during his tenure, uh, his office achieved the, the first convictions in hi in history for sexual slavery and for forced marriage as crimes against uh, humanity, as well as for attacks against peacekeepers and uh, and the recruitment and use of uh, children, child soldiers, um, as um, uh, so these became violations of international humanitarian law, uh, thanks to the uh, um, to the consistent efforts uh, of Ambassador Rapp and his team uh, during those uh, proceedings. Um, Ambassador uh, Rapp was also the uh, U.S. State Attorney in the North Northern District of Iowa in the, in the 1990s, from 1993 to 2001. And um, Ambassador, you just also mentioned uh, earlier that uh, uh, during a, a plane crash, there was a... There was a a uh, claim of uh, what is it over 340 million dollars uh, against you um which of course was resolved uh, in a in a positive way uh so um uh, ambassador rap received his uh, undergrad degree his bachelor's degree from harvard college and then he had attended uh, columbia and drake law schools and ultimately received his uh, law degree his jd from uh, drake uh so with this uh, i'd like to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Rapp, Stephen, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you had some adverse uh, conditions earlier, and we're extremely happy that you've uh, recovered fully, and then you're full, full of energy, obviously. You're with us tonight, and you're, you're, you're ready to travel extensively internationally to many, many countries and spread the, um, uh, you know, the idea, and but more importantly, the practice of global justice. So uh, talk to us about this uh, current extremely uh, complicated situation um, uh, whereby Russia has committed and continues to commit uh, heinous crimes uh, against um, uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, on a daily on a daily basis um, in the occupied territories uh, uh, that it still uh, is able to hold. Uh, but uh, you know, as we know, the uh, there were uh, initial verdicts uh, 
uh, and um, initial verdicts at The Hague related to the kidnapping of uh, illegal removal and kidnapping of children uh, from the occupied territories. Uh, but, you know, what is the status of this case uh, for um, ma making Russia responsible for the, for the crime of aggression, which is obviously where international politics and international law intersect? So, Stephen, Ambassador Rapp, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I'm glad to be with you for this, this UK talk. Uh, I was physically at, at the university in October on, on one of my four visits uh, to Ukraine since the full-scale invasion in February of, uh, of, of 2022 and, and look forward to being back there in person in the, in the near future. Uh, I should note also that I was uh, twice to Ukraine after 2014, after the uh, the events in, in Euro Maiden and and the, uh, the revolution of dignity there and the and of course the illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia and and the and the invasion of the of the Donbass and was then engaged as as U.S. ambassador at large uh, together with our embassy in in Kiev and in in persuading the government at that time uh, to give jurisdiction over uh, Ukraine to the International Criminal Court for serious violations of. Uh, of, of international law that, that might occur in the future. And it's it's good that that was done, uh, uh, two declarations in 2014 or 2015, because that's what gives the ICC jurisdiction uh, today. Uh, I, I also, uh, it, it's interesting, you note uh, uh, my my background as an international prosecutor prosecuting the Rwanda genocide and, and the massive atrocities committed in West Africa and Sierra Leone, including uh, prosecuting the uh, um, the, a president of, of a neighboring country for the crimes that he was committing in, in Sierra Leone, successfully uh, convicting him of 11 counts of war crimes and, and crimes against uh, humanity. My colleague in that was uh, uh, Brenda Hollis, who I think is an earlier speaker of yours uh, uh, in the in the AUK talks uh, uh, and, um, and currently working with Kareem Khan at the International Criminal Court in regard to the Ukraine case. Um, interesting you bring up the, the fact that I think the, the genocide deniers uh, in the Rwandan case actually sued me for $350 million. Uh, and it's an example of how uh, when you do fight for what's right and, and for what's true, there are those uh, people who are peddling uh, disinformation uh, on the other side and, and, and trying to destroy the opportunities of justice, trying to make uh, impunity uh, uh, the continued rule. And, and certainly it's the cause of my life. Uh, to end impunity for for horrendous crimes that, that victimize uh, men, women, and children in Ukraine and elsewhere in the world. I mean, today in Ukraine we have we have a war like we have not seen in Europe in in, in almost eighty years, and, and strong evidence of large scale commission of international crimes uh, on the Russian side. And when we talk about international crimes, we're really talking about four different kinds of crimes. Uh, that are crimes that can be prosecuted uh, often under law anywhere in, in the world because they're so serious that they're the kinds of crimes like piracy uh, in the old days. Uh, uh, the world can't live with these kinds of crimes. And, and so uh, we have laws, treaties, uh, tribunals established, and national courts often as well with jurisdiction. But those include war crimes, uh, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, uh, clearly, both are being committed uh, uh, on a wide-scale basis in, in Ukraine. The crime of genocide, uh, and certainly there's conduct uh, that falls within the defined acts of, of genocide under the Genocide Convention of, of, of 1948, a convention that had its origins uh, uh, with uh, my Raphael Lemkin when he was at the University of Lviv in western uh, Ukraine. And uh, uh, on the other hand, there is the, the high bar of Proving genocidal intent to, to destroy uh, people physically or biologically. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but there's also then a fourth international crime, aggression. Um, and many see that, and certainly the prosecutors at Nuremberg saw that as the overarching crime because it contains within it uh, the accumulated evil of the whole. Uh, all of these crimes are being committed uh, on the Russian side with an absolute expectation of, of impunity. Since World War II, there's, of course, been accountability for mass crimes that committed uh, by the Nazis at Nuremberg and elsewhere. And since the end of the Cold War, there's been accountability for atrocities from Rwanda to Sierra Leone to Cambodia uh, and, and in, for several African countries. 
but never has there been any crime, uh, accountability for the crimes of, of Stalin or those committed by the NKVD or the KGB or the FSB or the GRU. Uh, so instead, we've had impunity. The expectation that a leader and those who act on his behalf can get away with anything. Uh, we saw it in the in the total destruction of, of Gozhny in, in Chechnya within the Russian Federation. Uh, we see it in, in, in Syria, where Russia uh, advised the, uh, the Syrians actively in, in their perpetration of atrocities and then directly intervened in the war there in 2015. Uh, in, I've spent a lot of time on Ukraine, uh, in, a lot of time on Ukraine, but also on Syria. Uh, Syria remains, uh, because of the number of deaths and their brutality, uh, the worst uh, atrocity crime scene of the 21st century. And 90% of the crimes committed on the regime side with, with Russian support and often with uh, participation. The Russians helped the Assads develop their machinery of disappearance, detention, torture, and murder. Uh, with uh, you know almost 200,000 people disappeared off the street and sent into uh, uh, into overcrowded uh, uh, torture chambers, uh, where tens of thousands, as, as shown in the Caesar photos and in other evidence, uh, uh, did not survive. We also had, uh, particularly since the Russian direct intervention in 2015, the targeting of hospitals, medical personnel, humanitarian actors, much more dangerous to be a doctor or a nurse or a ambulance driver than it was to actually to be a terrorist. Uh, and then we've had the violation of the oldest norm in international law, uh, the, uh, which, the, uh, which Russia flew in support of, the, the dropping of chemical weapons. Um, you know, a weapon used in order to, uh, to kill people that were, that were hiding in shelters because those chemical weapons were heavier than air and, and could, uh, could reach those people that were otherwise surviving the blast. Uh, you know, in Ukraine, of course, we've got similar crimes on a massive scale, on an ongoing basis. We even hear today at, in Avirka of potential uh, killings of uh, civilians and, and, and prisoners. Uh, it's absolutely necessary, as we all know, to defeat Putin and his forces uh, uh, and for Ukraine to win this war. But it is also absolutely necessary there will be accountability for the crimes. Otherwise, Putin and others will do it again, even if there was some kind of a ceasefire or peace uh, in Ukraine, um, they would happen again when the conflict uh, restarts, and they would also happen elsewhere. Now, the fortunate thing, if there's anything fortunate about this horrendous uh, conflict, is unlike the situation in Syria, we do have uh, a range of judicial systems available. We have the International Criminal Court, which has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide committed in, in Ukraine since, since 2014. Uh, of course, the ICC is limited in what it can do. It's never prosecuted more than five people in any of the situations, in any of the situation countries in which it's been involved. Uh, and as a, a, a record of only taking the most, the most serious cases. But it does have the ability to prosecute chiefs of state and to prosecute foreign ministers and prime ministers where national systems can't do them. Of course, we have the Ukrainian prosecutor general's office and the whole system of, of, of law enforcement within Ukraine, investigations built by the SBU and by the national police with the active support from, from international teams. You hear the prosecutor general speaking of a 125,000 uh, war crimes or more uh, or incidents, events having been committed that constitute potential war crimes. And there's the potential for all of those cases to be prosecuted except those against the, 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 the senior leadership in Ukrainian courts. On the other hand, they're challenging to get custody of the individuals uh, and to build the cases uh, to the to the higher level beyond the perpetration by the individuals on, on the ground. Then we have third countries that are engaged and that can potentially prosecute as well. Third countries together with Ukraine have formed a joint investigative team, seven countries that are investigating together, looking for ways to bring these cases in other countries, uh, generally in Europe, where countries have, and we've seen it, uh, this has been the only avenue for, for justice in Syria, 
where there's the possibility of prosecuting international crimes committed elsewhere when there's jurisdiction in those third countries. And that generally happens when one of the perpetrators turns up in that country, the country has jurisdiction, or where one of the victims uh, of that crime is a citizen of that third country. And occasionally countries like Germany have full universal jurisdiction. So if, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a crime that's in the interest of that third country, say for instance, uh, uh, there are people that were injured in, uh, in, in attacks uh, by the Russians and Venezia and elsewhere that are now in medical treatment in Germany. Uh, Germany has an interest in justice in that case. And even without that victim having been a citizen at the time the crime happened, and even without the perpetrator being present in Germany, Germany can, for, a, for these kinds of crimes, uh, prosecute and potentially put out an indictment uh, against the uh, perpetrators, albeit not the highest level, because it's, an, it's a single country. You, know, you can't have prosecution uh, of, a, uh, of a head of state, a foreign minister, a prime minister by a national system alone. It takes an international court. And of course, we also now have this international center on the crime of aggression, uh, where the states that are involved uh, in the JIT, the seven states that are involved in that joint investigative team, together with my own country, the United States, are investigating the crime of aggression uh, committed uh, uh, by, uh, by Russian leaders. These are all criminal cases in the sense that they're about individuals that can be prosecuted, but they're investigating that case, uh, both in the context of what happened in 2014 but certainly the full-scale invasion in February of 2022. And, and, and since then, there is not a court yet to prosecute that crime, but this is kind of like a prosecutor's office to build the case waiting for that court to arrive. Anyway, let me just talk about uh, these crimes and uh, what they are, what, uh, what it takes uh, to prove them, uh, what, the, what can be done within uh, each of, of, of the systems. Of course, we start with, with war crimes, which was generally in, involved, you know, in intentional attacks or, or, or violent or oppressive actions against innocent civilians that aren't involved in the conflict or uh, involve uh, going after uh, prisoners or others that may have been involved in the conflict that are now out of the conflict or uh, are being detained or obviously not a uh, danger to anybody uh, uh, during that time period but then are treated brutally or humanely, inhumanely, you know, or, or, or in some other way, uh, abusively. Uh, and of course, we've got a whole body of law that's been established since 1864 on, on, on the laws of, of, of armed conflict. Uh, these cases uh, are sometimes difficult to make, and I often say they sort of come in, in kind of two flavors. One, they're the actions that are done on the ground uh, individually, uh, by by uh, by forces, uh, uh, thinking, for instance, of the horrors uh, committed in places like Busha, in Izium, the shooting of civilians in their gardens, detaining, torturing, and abusing uh, those citizens as well as ex-combatants, uh, and sometimes committing acts of sexual violence, sometimes uh, uh, killing people uh, uh, at, at the end of that time period. All of those acts are definitely war crimes. The challenge in those cases is proving higher level responsibility. We recall, of course, the case of the, the, of the 21 year old that was uh, prosecuted in Ukrainian courts for shooting the 62 year old uh, man on a, on, on a bicycle, clearly a war crime. But can you attribute that war crime up the chain of command? Can you attribute it to General Garizimov? Can you attribute it to a colonel or a major or somebody else that might be actually captured at some time on the field of battle? that might have given that order or given the general direction. Uh, but interna under international law, uh, we have the, the ability uh, to use what's called command responsibility, a legal doctrine that says that if a lower level guy commits a crime and his commander or another individual in effective control all the way up that chain of command has knowledge of those acts, and or should know about those acts and then fails to prevent or punish them, finds out about it, as Putin did about these crimes in Busha. And instead of, uh, uh, instead of, uh, of uh, starting a court martial against people who did abusive things, 
uh, they uh, in fact give an, uh, give an honor uh, to the to the brigade or to the unit that was uh, committing these horrendous acts. Uh, those kinds of uh, that kind of pattern can actually, under international law, allow you to prosecute the high level individual as if they committed the crime, as if they pulled the trigger, as if they committed the brutal act themselves. Uh, unfortunately, under Ukrainian law, that doctrine doesn't exist. And so when you have Ukrainian law, you have to actually show the order or the direction or the way in which the higher individual participated in uh, or contributed to uh, that crime. And that creates one of the challenges uh, that one has in, in prosecuting uh, individuals who may be captured as prisoners on other theaters and you don't know uh, exactly what they did uh, maybe earlier particularly in the invasion of, of, of the more central parts of, of, of Ukraine, Busha and elsewhere, the, where the Russians eventually withdrew. You may find someone who was actually there. You don't know it. Uh, in those situations, one needs the, the evidence of linkage. And, and you mentioned my involvement in the Commission of International Justice and Accountability. Our whole theme is linkage, uh, finding the orders, finding the communications, finding the, the command chain, et cetera. And, and on that, um, uh, the, you know, we're we're working with the the, the national police uh, and the military to to help gather together and and, and, uh, and digitize and analyze the tens of thousands of pages of, of Russian documents uh, that have been seized on the battlefield that were used for operational intelligence, but also need to be used for for, for criminal justice. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that I think is is important to develop in order to show that kind of high level responsibility. Then there, there are other kinds of crimes uh, that we see and that have caused enormous suffering in, in, in Ukraine. And those are the crimes that occur from, from bombardment, from, uh, uh, from bombs dropped by airplanes, from missiles and, and drones, uh, uh, or, or even from, from artillery. And, and we see, uh, just saw as I think many have, the, the, this new film that's just won awards, or, uh, 20 Days in Mariupol, um, and others, um, Friends and Human Rights Watch, have recently done a complete uh, analysis of the 86 days of the siege of, of, of Mariupol in terms of what, what, what happened there. Uh, can, you say, can you say that what happened was a war crime? The challenge there is, of course, that under the laws of, of, of the conduct of hostilities, um, you have to prove that attacking civilians or civilian infrastructure was intentional. If it was done mistakenly, then it's uh, then it's not a crime. If, on the other hand, there was a military target somewhere there and a civilian object was hit, uh, unless you got the analysis of how they targeted, unless you've got information uh, from the command of the uh, the perpetrators, it's very hard to show whether they were aiming at a military target, aiming at a civilian target. Moreover, international laws has these principles uh, uh, one, which is helpful, that an indiscriminate attack uh, is a crime. And, and I think that's certainly what we saw in, in, in Mariupol. Uh, it didn't make any difference whether it was civilian or military. They were hitting everything. And they didn't care. Indeed, they may have wanted uh, that the civilians suffer. And, uh, and that was their intention. Proving that intention, however, is difficult when obviously the city is being defended. And so if they do it indiscriminately, you can do an analysis and show it didn't make any difference where the military targets were. They were hitting buildings, they were hitting hospitals, they were hitting this, 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 everywhere, trying to basically do what Putin did in Grozny. Grozny rules, flatten it all, make them suffer. That's a crime. It's indiscriminate. On the other hand, where, where there were not an indiscriminate attack, so there's attacks here and there, et cetera, with, with horrible suffering, then you look at whether it appears that they've distinguished between military and civilian targets, whether they've taken any kind of precautions. And then you look at the proportionality. This proportionality is, is, is a complex thing because obviously if you have a military and civilian uh, uh, object and, and attacking it will cause some advantage militarily, uh, it may be proportionate to the military advantage and, and therefore not be a, a, a crime. On the other hand, we have these attacks on civilian inter energy infrastructure. I remember seeing those and feeling them in, in uh, the winter of 2022-23 when the Russians, uh, particularly after the uh, the attack, uh, for the successful closure of at least part of the uh, of the bridge between Crimea and Russia, 
Uh, there were attacks on utilities, attacks on gas uh, planes, attacks on, 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 on the things that people needed to survive during the cold Ukrainian winter. That seemed to be definitely civilian, and it really didn't have much to do with the conflict. One could argue disproportionate attack, uh, war crime. The Kokovka Dam, obviously, uh, seems to me a, a clear example of, of a disproportionate effect on the civilian infrastructure, indeed an environmental crime that will, will uh, have decades of, of effect. The attack on, on grain storage, something that uh, Ukraine has been successful in its in its, its naval efforts uh, in the in the Black Sea to, to prevent, but certainly the Russians have tried in, in uh, Odessa and elsewhere uh, to get to that grain storage and essentially uh, destroy um, grain that would, would feed people in Russia, or, or, I mean, anywhere in the world, uh, that grain is that Russia's trying to export its own grain, but uh, uh, Ukraine needs to be able to export grain and people around the world need that grain. And, and you're making those people suffer. So those are examples of, I think, disproportionate uh, attacks uh, that can be war crimes. And I think our friends in the International Criminal Court, including our friend Ben Hollis, are working very strongly on trying to develop a case where senior Russian leaders, uh, including military commanders, will be held responsible uh, for the war crimes that have been done through, through, through bombardment. Uh, of course, what we've had already on the war crimes context is the deportation of children. And people have wondered, I mean, it's a horrendous crime, um, you know, wonder why was that one first? Why not other crimes first? Well, th that was one where there was one, the action on the ground, it was clearly a war crime. And two, there was approval and support of that crime at the highest level knowledge of what they were doing, indeed, Putin signing a decree to accelerate permanent adoptions, uh, press conferences with Maria Lavova Belova, her boasting about her own uh, adoptions, this whole sort of uh, crazy attitude that they have that, uh, oh, they're doing these children a favor by tearing them away from, the, from their parents. It's, uh, uh, so you have the advantage there that you've got the action on the ground and you have the high level acknowledged responsibility. So that is one of the reasons why that crime is enormously serious in and of itself is the first to have, to have actually seen uh, an international arrest warrant. Let me uh, uh, move on to talk about crimes against humanity. And this is often used uh, because it sounds serious and indeed most people would view a crime against humanity as worse than a war crime, uh, though quite often the very same acts that are war crimes are also crimes against humanity. But to understand what they are, and that the law on that comes to us from Nuremberg, where the Nazis and all their acts, uh, their, 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 the Holocaust against the Jews, their, uh, their other uh, persecutive acts against people in the East and, and elsewhere during that, that conflict, those were were essentially crimes against humanity prosecuted uh, by the Nuremberg Tribunal. And since then, at all the international courts, we have prosecuted crimes against humanity. On the other hand, Ukraine itself, where it has a very comprehensive war crime statute, does not have crimes against humanity in its domestic statute. It was considered, but uh, uh, wasn't uh, finally approved. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, extremely important to have that in the criminal code and for the RADA to, to enact it as, as, as soon as possible. But to understand what crimes against humanity are, they are violent acts uh, committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. Now, this crime is most useful when you don't have an active war. And in many situations in the world, including what Russia is doing it to its own people right now, you could say those are crimes against humanity, even though there's not a war, a civil war within, within uh, Russia itself. Uh, I think of crimes uh, in the Ukrainian context, like those committed in Crimea after Russia's illegal annexation during periods that wasn't an active, an active war. Uh, but as I noted earlier, uh, during war, when you have patterns of crimes committed against civilians, it's part of widespread or systematic attack against civilians. So those can be war crimes as well. Uh, when I prosecuted President Charles Taylor uh, at, the, at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, 
we prosecuted him for murder as a war crime, murder as a as as a crime against humanity, rape and sexual slavery as a war crime and as a crime against humanity, uh, mutilations, chopping off of hands and arms uh, as as a war crime, crimes against humanity. I mean, we wanted to make sure that we had him for everything he had done, and and we were successful. Um, the one of the places, uh, I mean, and I should note also that the displacement of children uh, and deportation of, of children or deportation of, of populations is also a crime against humanity. And, and, and so the ICC could, if it wished to, uh, also indict Putin and Belova Belova and others uh, for, for, for that crime. The place where I think crimes against humanity would be the most useful in the Ukrainian context is in the cultural destruction and the appropriation. Uh, and because you could take it up to what I call the most serious crime against humanity, which is the crime of, of persecution, which is these violent acts committed in order to, to do it on a discriminatory basis against the nationality, against the religion, against an ethnicity. Uh, you have in what the Russians have done with their bombardments, uh, and it's been do widely documented, and people familiar with it, uh, uh, clearly a target again uh, targeting uh, of of elements of of of, of Ukrainian culture. And, and we see this in in the rhetoric of the of the propagandists, uh, their whole you know presentation as if Ukraine is not really a real country and does not deserve to 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 exist. And uh, and you see it, uh, in, fortunately, uh, we, we, unfortunately, I should say, when we dealt with uh, uh, with genocide, uh, when Raphael Lemkin invented the concept and, and saw it in an international treaty, uh, he included the idea of cultural genocide. But unfortunately, during the debates in the United Nations in 47 and 48, uh, cultural genocide was taken out of the treaty. And, and so that's not available. On the other hand, crime against humanity persecution does include what would be called cultural genocide. Uh, and I see that also in not just the destruction, but in the appropriation of, 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 of the history of, of, of the country. I recall it in the Kherson Museum uh, after, after Kherson was, was recaptured by Ukrainian forces, it was found that uh, uh, thousands of articles have been removed, and frankly, those articles have been taken to Crimea, and they've been relabeled as if they're as if they're Russian. Uh, it's, it's just an example of trying to tear the people's soul away and say your country doesn't exist, your nationality doesn't exist, your history doesn't exist. There's no, there's no, there's no great uh, Kiev of the eighth century. This is this doesn't exist. It's all Russia, and, and that is uh, a crime. And this effort to sort of uh, de Ukrainized uh, in the occupied territory is, is also in the same context. Interestingly, there was a case uh, in Poland after World War II uh, where, uh, where a Nazi Goliter, go Arthur Greiser, under the authority of the UN War Crimes Commission, was, was prosecuted for what he did, which was the Germanization of that area of Western Poland that at one time been part of Germany places like the camp of uh, Auschwitz, the death camp of, is of course, the Polish city then and before of Oswegson, Oswegson, I should say. And uh, and when he went in and, and did everything he could to eliminate the, 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 the reality of there ever having been the Polish language or the Polish people in that area. Well, he was convicted of the crimes against humanity of, of, of a persecution uh, by Polish courts under international authority. So it's the kind of crime that I think definitely needs to be prosecuted in the Ukrainian context. Um, let me just deal with genocide for a moment, and there may be questions uh, about genocide. As, as I've said, uh, it doesn't include the cultural genocide. And uh, you need to have not just the proof of murderous acts or incitement of those murderous acts, or extremely destructive acts, you also have to have the proof that it was done with the intent to physically and biologically destroy a, a people, a, a national, ethnic, religious, or racial group in whole or in substantial part. First thing I would note is that I think there are strong cases of direct and public incitement to genocide by certain individuals, 
uh, on the Russian side. And I, I say that as one that successfully prosecuted the Rwandan mass media, the leaders of the Rwandan mass media for direct and public incitement to genocide. They were calling for the, the killing of the Inyenzi, the, the cockroaches uh, on, on the other side. And, and the propaganda was an extremely important part of inciting the killing of 800,000 Tutsi Rwandans over the course of 100 days in 1994. Um, one doesn't have to prove for incitement, actually, that, that people were destroyed, only that there was an intent that they be destroyed in whole or substantial part, and that there was the strong possibility of it. And so when you have these uh, Russian propagandists and others that say, yeah, we're going to kill a million, we're going to kill five, we're going to kill five million uh, Ukrainians until they cease this crazy idea that they're Ukrainian cease to be people of the devil, cease to be fascist, etc. I mean, those, those people are, uh, are intending the destruction of, of the Ukrainian nation, the physical, biological destruction of it. And, and they're encouraging others to, do, to, to act uh, according to them. And whether or not that substantial destruction occurs, that substantial physical destruction occurs, that incitement is nonetheless a, a crime. And I, I know I talked really recently to prosecutor director, the prosecutor war crimes director, Yuri Bielazov, at the conference in Lviv in, in, in December. And there have been at least uh, two of these propagandists in absentia uh, convicted of direct and public incitement to genocide. Um, unfortunately, the, the Ukrainian statute on that is only a five year penalty, which obviously doesn't seem substantial enough under, under the circumstances. This, however, is a crime that could be prosecuted by the ICC as well, with the potential of a of, of, of a life uh, sentence. Uh, I would also note, we talk about genocide, uh, that the there is an aspect of the Genocide Convention that gives me hope that it could be used in the context of Ukraine in regard to what's happening with the children, because. The provision in the Genocide Convention that makes uh, that adds to the acts, the, the 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 movement of children, the forcible movement of children from one group to the other, uh, was added back in the debates in the Genocide Convention uh, in 1948. Actually, it was at the behest of the Greek delegation. Um, Greece had gone through a civil war. Uh, in which they had defeated essentially the Stalinist side, which had then withdrawn into uh, to Bulgaria, and they had taken children with them. And under those circumstances, the Ukrainians, the, the Greeks said, we need to have that as a genocidal act. Understand moving children from one group to another doesn't kill the child necessarily. It may, and obviously it weakens uh, every aspect of the child's emotional and physical support, but it it, it doesn't need to. Uh, but it makes they grow up differently, and they grow up in a different a different language and a different nation, etc. That is not there's no physical or biological destruction of human life in that situation. On the other hand, they've added them to the genocide convention, and and that I think gives us an opening to say that in this situation, they're looking at more than physical and biological destruction. We're looking at the destruction of that nationality through other means. And so I think that does give an opening to prosecute the, the forcible displacement of these children as, as, as genocide. Um, anyway, that would be something that could be done in Ukraine. It could some, be something that could be done as well at the International uh, Criminal Court. Finally, I want to deal with the crime of aggression and everyone I know has probably followed uh, the discussions and the leadership of the Ukrainian government uh, seeking to have a tribunal established uh, to try Russian leadership uh, for the crime of aggression. Uh, it's not possible at the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court does have aggression on the books, but it only uh, entered the books in, in, in 2017. And it... Uh, and it only applies if uh, if Russia had ratified the ICC and the amendment, and it does not. And so there is no jurisdiction in the ICC. Uh, there is jurisdiction in Ukrainian courts uh, to prosecute this crime as defined under, under Ukrainian law. It's the same as Russian law, the law that was established after Nuremberg. But you can't, uh, you can't uh, as I said before, a nation can't prosecute um, the leaders of another nation. And so you can't prosecute people that really made it happen. Now, 
specifically Vladimir Putin for the for the crime of, of aggression. Uh, there is a way to do it. And, and that way goes back to my own experience at the Sierra Leone court, where Sierra Leone entered into an agreement with the United Nations to establish an internationalized court by treaty. And, and because it was an international court by treaty, uh, essentially Sierra Leone gave its jurisdiction over every crime, every one of these crimes committed in its territory to that international crime, at least to the extent of, of, of the major perpetrators. And, uh, and based upon that, we were able to prosecute Charles Taylor from Liberia, who had never agreed to the court, who had never actually entered, never physically set foot in Sierra Leone, but he had sent in his forces to commit these horrendous acts that I've described earlier, the murder, the rape, the mutilation, et cetera. And, and so we were able to convict him even without Liberia having agreed uh, to, to that court. Well, that's what Ukraine has been attempting to do uh, in, in seeking potentially to have a resolution of the UN General Assembly that would make an agreement uh, within the government of Ukraine to establish an international court. On the other hand, there's concern that, uh, and, and, and greater concern in the wake of what's happened in Gaza since October, that uh, there isn't a broad enough support in the UN General Assembly. There's not the 142 votes there was to denounce Russian aggression. There's not even maybe the 90 or so votes that was established that were that was there to establish the claims uh, process. And so it could be a weak vote or it could be maybe insufficient uh, a vote uh, uh, to establish such a court. And so that's led to the consideration of, of other alternatives, establishing that court together with the European Union or with the Council of Europe, or potentially having it as a series of states that sign up. Uh, on the other hand, if it's just a series of states, uh, you know, that could, Russia could establish a series of states with Russia and Iran and Cuba, and Nicaragua, et cetera, and then try everybody else. Uh, it's not enough just to have a handful. It needs to be a broad group of states from all over the world. Uh, but in any case, it it is, I think, essential that this court be established and that these cases be developed. Uh, and people ask why. Well, can't we prosecute Putin as we have already for uh, uh, for the war crimes uh, and crimes against humanity? Can't we prosecute Burisma for the war crimes? Can't we prosecute these other people for the war crimes? Why why do we need uh, uh, something uh, for for aggression? My my sense of that is that we look at what was really the overarching crime here. Uh, you know, and, and all of us uh, who, who know and love Ukraine, uh, you know, take ourselves back to the full-scale invasion now just two years ago, when people are going about their 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 work, going to, to, going to school, living their lives, trying to build their families and businesses and everything else, and then suddenly there's death from the skies. You see it in this... In, in the films from, uh, you know, from, from Mariupol, I mean, saying, what have we done to deserve this? Nothing, nothing was done by the people of Ukraine. Nothing was done by the government of Ukraine that justified the invasion of the country. And every act was done by the Russians. Every shell, and I'm not counting just the shells that fell on schools, the shells that fell on a police station or a military base, all of those shells were illegal. And those people that have died and suffered, including the combatants that have died in, at, at Virka and, and, and elsewhere, uh, young men who, who've gone to war, who should be, should be at work supporting their families, et cetera. Those people are victims of Russian aggression, even though they're not victims of Russian war crimes. I mean, it's, it's legal to shoot another soldier across the battlefield. It's not a war crime. But it is the crime of aggression. And so I think that it's essential that, uh, that we establish a tribunal. And I, I know that the Ukrainian government and their special ambassador, Anton Kornevich, are continuing discussions. And I certainly do everything that I can to help get this court established and get it established this year. Uh, because if we don't, the impunity uh for for the aggression this bold aggression something we haven't seen in europe uh, since since 1939 uh, this kind of crime um you know will happen again as we've seen from putin and from the way in which he thinks he can get away with anything impunity 
breeds impunity. And if we don't lay down the law, if we don't establish a court and prosecute those truly responsible for it, it'll happen again in Ukraine and elsewhere, and no one will be safe anywhere in the world. Thank you very much. Those are my, I've gone on for 45 minutes, but uh, those are my preliminary remarks. I'm glad to answer your questions and uh, the rest of the time that we have. Thank well, you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, uh, we we could have been, we could have listened to you for four hours. I mean, this is really uh, not only a, a, a very intriguing um, expose and a discussion, uh, but also it's an extremely relevant um, uh, question because this is really noble, as you as you pointed out. So, I mean, people have been dealing with uh, the crimes of of uh, genocide for decades now, almost uh, you know eighty years, uh, is it not? Uh, but the crime of aggression has always been such a uh, uh, hard uh, not to tackle because you you have to uh, to to prove it at so many different levels. You have to prove the involvement of the state at the highest level, uh, and as you mentioned, you know, shooting a a soldier across the field is not a is not a war crime, but it's a crime of aggression. If you, if you initiated this uh, this aggression without any legal justification, which leads me to the uh, question, I'm gonna kind of use my um, prerogatives as the uh, moderator to ask you a couple of um, questions. Some of them may be a bit challenging. I'm gonna play the devil's advocate if you don't mind, and then I'll open in the last thirty minutes uh, the floor for discussion. We already have uh, several really interesting questions. Um, as we uh, spoke earlier during our initial conversation, I personally am not a lawyer. Uh, I have a degree from the Fletcher School, uh, and I've, um, that's where I kind of started uh, studying the intersection of law and international politics. Uh, uh, and also um, at the NATO level, I pioneered the study of the lawfare, the legal warfare, quasi-legal warfare that's, that's extensively used by Russia. So what I want to ask you is... Um, now, we all hope that those terrible, those heinous crimes will be punished one day. Of course, this is what, what the entire civilized humanity wants. And most of all, of course, uh, uh, the Ukrainians who have been suffering, uh, you know, for, through this uh, nightmare day, day in, day out. Um, however, knowing how uh, good, in a negative sense, but, but still how, um, how serious the Russians are, in exploiting international law, abusing international law, really, um, you know, bending and twisting it. I mean, this is this is the nature of their lawfare. I mean, everybody there, even Putin, when he makes statements, even when he talks about the history, even even though we know it's propaganda, it's falsehood, these are lies, but they all claim uh, a quasi legality of their actions. It's you would never see a Russian leader who would go out and say. Well, we did this because uh, um, because might uh, you know equals right. No, they always say we have the right to do it. Ukraine didn't exist. You, uh, Lenin gave them this territory, the other territory. So they would go back centuries and bring all possible evidence, which of course is irrelevant. But still, they they act and talk as if they are on the right side of the law. You would never hear them say. Well, we knew we were wrong, we just did it. No, it's always they are the victim, the way they portray themselves. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, aggression, okay, let's take Crimea. Uh, we push on them and say, you know, you, you've occupied Crimea, it's illegal. The annexation, they say, well, I mean, we just uh, help the people express their legitimate vote. Uh, uh, there was a referendum. So what I'm, I guess what I'm, what I'm uh, uh, striking at is that we're going to hit a uh, very serious, uh, very coordinated uh, defense on their end, uh, trying to bend our own international law and show that, try to, to prove to the world, and of course to their population, that, well, I mean, the law is actually, there are two sides arguing. There isn't really this universality. Uh, look at what the West was doing in, Kos in Kosovo. Look at what the West did in Iraq, what, what, what the West America did in Libya or NATO. This legal whataboutism. Are we sufficiently prepared to handle all of these counterclaims? Because there, there will be many, many of those. With, with all the money Putin's regime has, with all the influence they have across really the West, sadly, uh, I would expect the um, their legal defense, if ever they are captured and brought to trial, to be really serious uh, in the sense that 
trying to prove that whatever they did was just, uh, you know, within their own prerogatives. That's what they believed was right based on history, based on, the, you know, their interpretation of the law. And again, I, I, I grant everything they do is absolutely wrong. They need to be punished. Are we sufficiently prepared to actually uh, handle handle some of those egregious claims that they're making to to defend themselves? Well, this is why we need a court and, okay. and, and a court with with judges from from all over the world. I mean, I I sat in a People's Tribunal a, a year ago this week in in in, uh, uh, in in the Hague, where we had a, a judge from India and a judge from South Africa and myself from the United States, and we unanimously agreed. Uh, there was sufficient evidence to prosecute Putin for the crime of aggression, and 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 we dealt with the potential defenses that he would that, that he would have, and and frankly, uh, the sort of arguments that they present are, are not are not strong ones. <laughs> I mean, there is uh, there's there's no question that uh, I mean Russia, under an international agreement to sign after Ukraine gave up uh, nuclear weapons, explicitly guaranteed. The, uh, uh, the 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 borders the the, the 1991 borders of, of of Ukraine and uh, and there is no justification for invading I mean there that issue has come up in a, in a way in the in International Court of Justice case um, understand the International Court of Justice in The Hague only has jurisdiction when there's an explicit treaty and uh, as you remember Ukraine went to court just after the full scale invasion. Uh, because uh, Putin, in one of his midnight addresses, had alleged genocide of Russian speakers in the East, etc. Uh, and that was a justification. I mean, as you say, using the law, uh, uh, you know, for his own purposes. I mean, he's out committing what a lot of us think of genocide. And he's saying, oh, they're, they're the ones that are committing yeah. genocide. And uh, and in, 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 in rather clever action, uh, the Ukrainian, Ukraine's lawyers said, if there is no aggress there's no genocide happening. Uh, and even if there were, you're not justified in invading it. But anyway, they filed that lawsuit. And on that aspect of the case uh, thus far, uh, the case has been successful. Uh, clearly, there was no genocide being committed. Uh, uh, and Russia's continued to commit horrible crimes against areas that were dominantly uh, Russian speaking, et cetera. And, and you can't find uh, any evidence other than stuff that they've made up that would that would indicate uh, that uh, that these these kinds of acts were being committed on the Ukrainian side, and so yeah, that was that was sort of knocked down within that case. But it would need to be knocked down in a tribunal as as well to show that there was no justification. I mean, the idea that uh, you know, Ukraine might someday join NATO, which is a defensive alliance, so we've got to get in there and attack them to keep them from joining NATO. Well, it's a defensive alliance. They haven't joined it yet. <laughs> and maybe, and frankly, I mean, uh, certainly I'm one of once uh, uh, Ukraine uh, in NATO, but uh, as we had in our trial, we had an expert witness from General Clark, the former NATO uh, uh, commander. And he said, frankly, if it weren't for the Russian invasion, Ukraine would probably never have been able to join NATO. Now it may happen. <laughs> so it wasn't happening in February of 2022 before the invasion. There were, and even if it had, it wouldn't have been a justification. So each of these points can be dealt with uh, uh, clearly under uh, under international law. And uh, you, in, in just because uh, Ukraine was part of the uh, of the Soviet Union or part of the Russian Empire at one time or not. Um, or even getting going back to the 8th century where we know Ukraine existed before Russia did, <laughs> et cetera. I mean, those are interesting kinds of arguments, but the, the fundamental point is Ukraine is a sovereign state. Its sovereignty has been guaranteed and assured under international agreement, and it cannot be invaded uh, uh, by, by an, another country absent, uh, you know, a, a claim of self-defense. And there was no attack by, 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 by Ukraine in, in, into Russia. And so uh, very, very clearly, uh, this, the acts committed by Russia are, un, uh, are unjustified and not just unjustified, given the law on aggression uh, that was developed at Nuremberg in, in a case in which the Russians and the Americans and the French and the Brits were uh, together prosecuting, uh, uh, the same kind of crime has been committed here by Russia that the, the Nazis committed in, in 1939 or in 1941, etc. And so there's, uh, I, I don't think there's any question that uh, that we have a crime. And then the question is, who's responsible for the crime? Well, you know, that's uh, 
That's one of the easier situations given given uh, 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 Putin's uh, public declarations uh, during the week leading up to February 24. Go back to, uh, and then uh, the whole thing. You let's go back to to uh, uh, to Crimea. Go back to Donbass, et cetera. And obviously, you you can have uh, separatist movements uh, existing in various places, uh, but that does not uh, justify. Uh, aggression against those countries and uh, or those regions or those those peoples and uh, there are ways in which those can be resolved uh, under under international law by by agreement or negotiation when countries separate like Czechoslovakia separated into two countries there are ways that that can be done legally but uh, uh, that was not done here and in a, a referendum or a plebiscite that occurs under the gun after you've uh, sent your green man in there with your military support uh, isn't isn't a justified referendum uh, either in Crimea in 2014 or in the four regions where the Russians conducted their phony uh, uh, referendum uh, a year and a half ago. And Ambassador, uh, everything you say is absolutely true. And um, uh, what is, what I wanted to underline is that uh, when you make a historical analysis of Russian aggressions from really the last three four hundred years, uh, it's always always they try to claim the high legal ground that they are the victim of some somebody else's aggression that they're preempting or most often than not as was the case with Crimea or with the Donbass that they actually come to the aid of someone of some population what is the Ottoman Empire what is the Austrian Empire what is Ukraine they they always conjure up some separate population that supposedly needs the protection of the Russian army what is Georgia and and so when they come, they actually claim that they they're not really attacking that country. It's a okay special military operation to protect uh, Russian speakers or to depose a a uh, un, you know uh, hostile government. So again, these old crimes they absolutely must be punished. But what I'm I guess what I'm saying is we have to be prepared for a very vigorous uh, defense because these uh, this regime unless it collapses and and Putin is you know obviously rendered to. To, to you know to serve and to, to be uh, to be sentenced uh, the, the defense will be vigorous and they will come up with all so sorts of creative approaches so it's not, we got to be we got to brace ourselves for a serious legal fight that's what I'm saying even though we know we're on the right side of of the law and of history I mean and, and you'll hear the what about is you know I mean and I, exactly. I always had to to deal with that when I was prosecuting in any one of these situations. Why are you prosecuting this guy? There's another dictator. It's almost as bad. Why aren't you prosecuting him? Well, that's, that's like you murder somebody and you say, you can't prosecute me unless you prosecute all the murderers. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. No, it, those aren't defenses, you know, obviously. Uh, and, and to a large extent uh, at the international level, uh, not in not every situation. I mentioned Syria earlier. Is there a court with jurisdiction? In some cases, you've got a court with jurisdiction. And obviously, we'd like it to be more universal and more complete and absent double standards. But uh, but the fact that the system of international law or international courts aren't comprehensive is no reason for not prosecuting those crimes that you can prosecute, as long as you do it fairly, as long as you do it based upon the facts and the law. And, and, and in that, it's important. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the international law wants to, when you're prosecuting leaders wants to have an international court uh, uh, so it's not just somebody uh, you know hating the guy on the other side whoever's at fault you're always going to hate the guy on the other side uh, you need to have a, a, a court with, with judges from from all over the world who, who can uh, can judge it without any kind of uh, bias whatsoever um ambassador have you uh, seen a couple of days ago there was a um and there was the news came out that the, the Russians have actually um, opened the legal case or have put the uh, um, the uh, Estonian uh, uh, president actually on a, on the most right. wanted list. Yes, yeah, right. so this is their lawfare par excellence. You know, if you target us, we're gonna start targeting your politicians. You have you you have your own Western law. We're gonna have our own legal zone of exclusivity, as you mentioned, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, whoever. Hey, but, but, but in the end, it's it's bogus and rotten to the core. It's as rotten as Indeed, the way that yeah. they, you know, they lock up people for putting uh, flowers uh, uh, out for, for Navalny. Uh, they're not uh, uh, 
they make it up as they go along. We're, we're, ta we're talking here about legal principles that, that have existed, that the Russians, in fact, when they were working with other countries, uh, helped establish at places like Nuremberg. I mean, I wonder, I mean, the Russians, of course, have been prosecuting people at Rostov on Don, I understand, you know, they, they, uh, after, they, after they torture them, they're putting, uh, you know, the defenders of, of the uh, Azovstal, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, on trial. For what crime? Uh, for, 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 you know, being under a bomb? <laughs> oh, we're defending your country? These are crimes, et cetera. I mean, you know, they're, they're making it up. And what, what, uh, what crime is the prime minister of, of Estonia committing, you know, that under, under, under the national law? Estonia obviously is a country that could, could obviously suffer greatly from, the, from what Russia has done with Ukraine, because they obviously have populations, uh, those populations want to be under Russia, but, you know, that were put there by Stalin when Estonians were sent to Siberia, you know, there'll, there'll always be these arguments uh, that, oh, we've got some uh, Russian speakers, or we've got some Russian nationality people, et cetera, and therefore we're justified invading. Yeah. Um, you know, that, and and they're not justified, you know, and it isn't a justification that there's uh, people of your nationality in another country, and therefore you're entitled to go invade that country. That's never a justification, uh, not even if they're being mistreated. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. for as long as the regime continues to exist, we can expect uh, this type of bold behavior, bold uh, talk, you know, aggressive talking and action. So uh, let's say I'm, I'm going to move on to the questions. We have about uh, 20, 25 minutes. There are really a couple of like, half a dozen good questions. Uh, one of them uh, deals with the hypothetical. Um, let's say, you know, Russia's regime collapses tomorrow, I don't know, in a month. You know, a year's time, Putin is rendered uh, to 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 be to face justice in the Hague. What is the the most that he can expect? Uh, ultimately, okay, uh, uh, the court will will like, hopefully sentence him. Uh, um, you know, based on the principles that you just delineated, and what he's going to sit in a comfortable cell with a TV like Milosevic, and then you know, in a couple of you know, dozen years or so, he'll just. You know, pass away. So that's. I mean, I guess the question is, what what would happen to him or any other regime member who is apprehended? I mean, yeah, under the Western uh, legal system. Yeah. Well, under the uh, uh, certainly uh, under international courts, international courts uh, being essentially established by by through the UN and and uh, um, under international law, don't use the death penalty. That's illegal. And mm -hmm. so the, the the longest sentences and the sentences that I generally obtained when I was prosecuting the Rwanda genocide were life sentences. At the ICC, the longest sentence is actually uh, 30 years. Uh, of course, uh, when you're in your 70s, as Putin is, uh, that's plenty, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, it is it is a sentence for the rest of their life. And, and uh, the ICC uh, uh, has agreements with various countries uh, to, uh, for, for, to, you know, that agree to... Uh, Accept the people for imprisonment, et cetera. And so uh, he wouldn't be imprisoned in a Hague. He, he would be imp imprisoned in, uh, uh, in probably in a European country that's agreed to, 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 to take it. So that's that's as bad as it is, uh, you know, in terms of the sentence. Uh, do, you know, I'm I'm most interested in the trial, the fact that he'll be there in, in the dock and and facing his uh, uh, facing his victims. And, and they'll be able to testify against it. And, and uh, you know, as, as I've dealt with these cases uh, at the at the international level, particularly where they've happened in places people never thought justice was possible, it was sort of like you know that guy ground me down into the ground of my whole family, and my whole country, and my whole community, et cetera. And, and today I'm I'm standing tall. I'm standing taller than he is. I'm telling the truth, and, I, and I'm being credited with that, with that testimony and credited with the truth. And, and he's being punished for, for this crime. The proof is there. So that that's an extremely important part of it. And, and given the seriousness of this crime, that obviously should contain, should have the, the most serious punishments that are possible under international law, which is generally essentially life sentences. But, you know, every element of the crime would have to be proved be, be, beyond a, a reasonable doubt. And, uh, uh, you know, in the Rwanda uh, tribunal and the Yugoslavia tribunal, uh, about 20% of the cases resulted in acquittals. Even even at Nuremberg, the three of the Nazi leaders of the 22 that were on trial were acquitted. Still, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, 
you know, um, as, as Justice Jackson, the, the leading American prosecutor at Nuremberg said, it's a it's a tribute that power pays to reasons. We're the most we're powerful. We could execute these guys, but no, we're going to put them on trial and we're going to have it uh, judged fairly. And, and that will contribute more to future peace and to prevention than any act of, of, of vengeance. Well, of course, we don't want these uh, criminals, uh, these mass murderers to become martyrs. So you're absolutely yeah, right. Or... Just killing them just out of just because it's not enough. And unfortunately, with the death and suffering, the hundreds of thousands and millions of people that Putin and his regime have caused to uh, to die, there's no way we can kill him or execute him a million times over. So it's much more important to actually uh, uh, pass judgment on the criminality of his, the actions of his regime and of his regime in general, if possible. Now, this leads me to one of the, to another question by, by one of our guests. Uh, uh, and it is, um, do you see a realistic enforcement, enforcement mechanism uh, for, for Russians for their war crimes, given that Russia possesses nukes? I guess the question is the interaction of, of grand politics and, and uh, nuclear politics and then international law. Obviously, you know, uh, how would you sentence the leader of a country that's one of the you know five recognized nuclear powers? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I mean, um... It is difficult to uh, uh, to to obtain uh, the arrest of people who are leaders of powerful countries. There's no question about that. Um, you know, and and obviously in the cases that we have uh, internationally, I mean Nuremberg, it, we had to defeat the, the the Nazis before we could put them on trial. I mean, an arrest warrant against Hitler in 1944 wouldn't have wouldn't have resulted in any changes at the Russian conduct. But uh, it was important afterwards uh, to bring the survivors, the surviving leaders, uh, to trial, and it was possible because of the success of that of that conflict, uh, the victory of the Allies. But um, in other situations, it's been possible to achieve that justice. Uh, uh, you know, people may have mixed feelings about the, the the Milosevic case, but you know, he was he was indicted in May of ninety of ninety nine when he was president of uh, Yugoslavia, and people said, "This is crazy." Why are you doing it? You want to uh, it was during the Kosovo conflict. Don't you want him to surrender Kosovo or you know get out? And this won't this will not contribute to peace. Uh, but within a within a you know a couple months he would withdrawn from 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 Kosovo, and within fifteen months uh, he couldn't steal enough votes to get reelected in 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 Belgrade. Uh, a fellow nationalist who agreed with him about agreed with Serbia, but didn't agree with him about war crimes. Kostinica was elected. And then, uh, then they began to discover all the ways that he was corrupt, and, and the Serbian authorities began to prosecute him for that. Those cases are going to be hot to handle. And meanwhile, they were looking at a situation where sanctions were on the country, and there was no hope of it moving forward into the EU. And so, uh, in order to uh, to get out from under the sanctions, uh, uh, they uh, uh, and, and have a chance of getting into the EU, where they demanded full cooperation with international courts. Uh, they surrendered it, and uh, you know, within 25 months of his indictment, he was in the hay. And so, you know, you you deal with a situation like like Russia now. You know, if they want to get out from under sanctions and they get back uh, into the global financial system, etc., the price of that may be, you know, that they've got to cooperate with international justice. Uh, will it happen? Uh, given the, the nature of the conflict on the ground, and there it is now. Uh, you know, it's. It's uncertain, but it's happened in other situations where people didn't think there was there, there was any chance. Uh, and even if it doesn't happen, while well, Putin is alive, he is a pariah. He couldn't go to South Africa for the BRICS summit. And he's, Brazil said, well, we'll try to figure out a way to have him come for the next BRICS summit. And nope, nope, they can't figure out a way. And they'll have to arrest him. And so there are like 123 countries that he could go to, including Armenia. Uh, you know, where if he goes, they're obliged to arrest him and send him to the home. Okay, well, maybe he's maybe he's happy living in his billion dollar mansions and et cetera, and he doesn't need it, but he's not gonna be able to visit those yachts in the Mediterranean that he, that he paid for from stolen money. You know, it, it, it is really changing the the, the, the situation in, in the world. And, and I often see it even in a part of leaders of countries when we later read some of the intel about what they were saying when things were happening. Well, we don't want to be in the Hague. 
<laughs> but we don't want to be international pariahs. We don't want to. We want to be able to visit our children and our relatives that have gone off elsewhere. You know, it it, it is affecting them all, all, already, and we shouldn't minimize that. But it's it's extremely important, however, that we do make some arrests. Uh, the system needs to be credible, and uh, and and this arrest warrant should, frankly, never be traded away. Yet. And it won't be. The ICC, the ICC once it makes an arrest warrant. They don't have a legal way to get rid of it. The Security Council can suspend an arrest warrant for a year at a time for peace reasons. But th those those suspensions can be vetoed. And so uh, he's going to be under an arrest warrant for as long as he lives. Hopefully it will be an arrest warrant that's executed uh, by by a, uh, an arrest and, and, uh, and by a trial and by a conviction. Well, it's uh, encouraging to hear from you that um, the uh, international legal system uh, uh, still commands uh, enough respect. Uh, so even as you mentioned, countries like Brazil, like even Armenia, which is considered uh, within, you know, to a great extent within the Russia's camp, is is um, ob ob obligated under under their legal commitments to actually uh, arrest uh, Putin. So so that's um, that's indeed uh, a testament to the power of international law, and we must uphold it, of course, through. Uh, upholding the peremptory norms of international law and, and not allow Russia to make the system too fluid, whereby everything is up for grabs, everything is up for debate, and there is no stable rules within the uh, this this uh, uh, global. There are no stable norms. Uh, and we we need to keep up upholding them, as you mentioned uh, correctly. Uh, how about um, okay? We, we've been talking about Putin, the political leadership. How about his military chain of command, Gerasimov, uh, Shoigu? I mean, obviously, uh, you mentioned Nuremberg several times, and several of the uh, of the planners of the uh, of, of the uh, Nazi uh, aggression, uh, the uh, chief of staff uh, Keitel and uh, and others were actually, um, you know, sitting there, and then they were sentenced, and some of them were executed. So, do we what what, what do we have uh, for them in case we're able to get a hold of them first? And, and certainly. Uh... Uh, the, the commanders of the military force uh, can be among the group that are prosecuted for the crime of aggression. At, at, at the international level, we generally view the crime of aggression as a leadership crime. We don't we don't prosecute the corporal for crossing the border. He didn't even know where the border was, etc. Uh, but we're the person that made it happen, and that certainly includes people like Defense Minister Shoigu or the Chief of Staff uh, uh, Grisimov and, and and others. They can be prosecuted, and they can be uh, and and. Frankly, they could potentially even be prosecuted in Ukrainian courts if we, if we could get uh, get custody of them. It may be may be challenging, but um, the possibilities are real. Real sometime in the future that they might be traveling or they might turn up someplace, etc. They might go to a to a to a meeting of a of a, of of potential allies in the third world and suddenly find themselves under an arrest warrant. So it's important to do that. I would note, um, I mean, one of the challenges uh, in Ukrainian justice at the moment is that, um, you know, even as we speak of 125,000 war crimes that have been committed, uh, there really needs to be, uh, you know, a development of a strategy uh, in terms of the senior leaders and others that should be targeted and, and focused on. Uh, to a large extent, the the, the way in which the system works is quite different than, say, it works at the international tribunals. In an international tribunal, you know, like, say, the Yugoslavia one, we would deal with the crimes happening in Bosnia and in Croatia and in Serbia and in Kosovo, et cetera. We would deal with the with the uh, the prisons where people were tortured or sexually violated. We deal with the, the 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 you know the destruction of the cultural heritage of Dubrovnik. We would have a variety of different major crimes. And then we would be sort of seeking out who were the people that really made this happen. And so we would develop an array of, 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 of the structure and, and come up with the, with the key leaders. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that's easy to do within the Ukrainian uh, justice system because it's divided, different prosecutors in different regions. You also have the prosecutor and the police in separate departments. So the police develop the investigations and the, the prosecutor, the prosecutor sends it back and says he needs a little more. Whereas at the international level, everything is all together and we can deal with it in a coordinated way. 
and, and I know efforts are being made uh, uh, to, to try to develop cases in a more coordinated way, but I think it's important for, for Ukraine to look at prosecuting the, the leaders in of various uh, military units, et cetera, in various places uh, that have committed, the, uh, on which there's strong cases, and then to really develop the evidence, the linkage between those people and the crimes on the ground. And then when there are prisoners taken, uh, that you know there'd be a clear evaluation, for instance, before you exchange somebody. And I understand the strong motivation to exchange people, particularly when uh, Ukrainian prisoners of war are being so horribly mistreated. But you know, sometimes you get a high-level individual; they may give you fifty prisoners for one for one guy. <laughs> so well, maybe maybe that's an okay trade. But there are certainly cases where where it's important to actually have a trial of a person that's in custody and not in absentia in order to show that there really are consequences and in order to have the, 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 the victims uh, testify and in order to see justice uh, justice done. Uh, uh, that's difficult. And, and we also know that in many conflicts that we've had in the past, when I was prosecuting Rwanda or when the allies were prosecuting at Nuremberg, uh, the, the, the war was over. And so it's it's hard to do this uh, when the war is was is ongoing. But as as it goes on, it is important if you can to have these kind of prosecutions. So so the evidence is seen and people see it, and there's an opportunity to uh, to to confront the, the perpetrators and, and to sentence them and send them to, to prison before uh, uh, before even the conflict ends. Um, in that regard, since we've covered the political leadership and then the uh military leadership, and you pointed out correctly, it's one of the great lessons from, I think, from today's session is that uh, the cri crime of aggression is a crime of leadership. Obviously, when mm -hmm. not looking at the lower levels, we're looking at the higher levels. But there is a great question that just popped up in the chat. How about the Russian propagandists? I mean, they're technically not in the chain of command, neither the military nor the political one, but day in and day out, especially those three names, um, you know, they're the most popular, the most famous ones that kind of like a personify the the, the Russian uh, what, what what was Goebbels for the Nazi system uh, those three names for the Russian system uh, Goebbels of course committed uh, suicide together with Hitler but those three people if they're uh, those three propagandists if they're ever apprehended what of them I mean they've been pumping out this vitriolic hatred for Ukraine to to for the West which has really impacted uh, in my uh, in opinion, the behavior of Russian soldiers. I mean, from day one, the committing of terrible, uh, heinous crimes, rape, killing, you know, murders, etc. Normally, these things happen after many months and years of, of, of heavy fighting when the soldiers are really, uh, some of them out of their mind, and extremely, you know, obviously aggressive and happy, but not from the fir very first day of, of an occupation. That means that they had been bombarded, prepared, uh, uh, primed up for, for these crimes by by someone, and I don't think it's an or it wasn't a, uh, necessarily a written order from Putin. It was more obviously the atmosphere within Russia. So it's you know it's Russia's war, and these propagandists have a lot uh, to to be blamed for. So what of them? What, what do we do with them? Yeah, um, let me deal first with the Ukrainian system. I mean, I, I mentioned there's the the crime of incitement to genocide, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, and and I think a couple of these fellows, I don't know if Kasparian or who it was, uh, which there are two because I've seen the files earlier, but I wasn't sure where the convictions. I, mean, but I think they were happening in a regional court. A couple of them were convicted of incitement to genocide, but that only carried a five-year sentence and it was done in absentia. Now that would probably have to be redone because apparently they can't do an absentia trials for a, a crime that has less than a 10 year sentence. So uh, one would, if one wants to prosecute, it's best to try to prosecute them for, for the genocide itself or for the crimes, the war crimes that they uh, instigate or cause, and then you hold them responsible for the crime itself. But that, that takes uh, the linkage evidence, the insider witnesses, the, uh, the, the 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 propaganda being written on the wall in in Busha uh, that quotes the uh, uh, quotes one of the propagandists, <laughs> etc. I mean, you need that that sort of evidence to 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 yeah. tie them together, and that's what we've had to do uh, in 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 other courts, like in the case of the Rwanda media. Uh, but as I say, that's that's a uh, potential to do it. But it's it uh, as, as I've noted. 
so having, having read some of what they've written, it seemed to me that this clearly was incitement to, to genocide. It's the crime of incitement unless you can prove that it actually caused the genocide or it's, uh, or it's, or you can prove them commit some other crime, then you can hold them responsible as, a, as an instigator or as an accomplice of that crime. So anyway, that's, that's uh, again, the kind of thing you need linkage evidence for. Uh, the ICC, of course, could prosecute these, these individuals, even for incitement to genocide, and it'd be a case to, to, to look at. And, and there would be the issue of, uh, you know, whether, whether the intent uh, could, could be proven by, by, by the language, et cetera. But, I, but as I say, uh, I think the intent uh, is, is pretty clear from, from that language and, and is understood then by some listeners uh, as, as such. And they're, they're dealing with a situation where there are extremists and others uh, and soldiers and, who may react and, and act on. If you can show that there's that possibility you could convict them of direct incitement to genocide at the at the International Criminal Court, even in the absence of prosecuting a, a genocide case. Okay, uh, in the really couple of minutes that we have left, I have two good questions, which I'm going to combine as uh, kind of mm -hmm. two sides of one before we, we finish this uh, exceptional session. Uh, the first one is, is it possible, um, let's imagine a hypothetical scenario that Tomorrow, next month, uh, the Russian leadership sues for peace. So they say, well, we, we, we're drawing, you know, the conditions are, you know, adverse. We figure out they can't, uh, we can't continue. Let's just, uh, let's just uh, all sit together and get along, try to get along. Is there, is there a chance that the international community is so obsessed with uh, achieving peace that they fail uh, to achieve justice? Or has those, has the level of um, uh, crimes transcended Ukraine and it's so global in scope, uh, especially in its future implications that they, it, they must be punished. So, re in other words, regarding what Putin says, okay, I give up. You know, tomorrow everything is over. Still, he, he and his regime have to be punished. Uh, and the other side of the question is, what are, what about our own American political situation with uh, with um, you know obviously many Republicans uh, within the MAGA movement under under you know. Uh, influence from from Trump and the potential return of, of Trump to, to the helm of American politics, uh, would that have an impact uh, in, in lessening the support for such a legal uh, for such a legal case against uh, Russia? Well, um, I mean, these are these are uh, complicated questions. But first of all, I mean, we have a number of situations in the world where people say, well, if they would just stop the conflict, say in Syria and have a peace, we, you know, shouldn't there be an amnesty? But under international law, amnesties are not legal for serious international crimes, and so, and that's been well established. I mean, you could, uh, the international community might give up trying to establish an aggression tribunal. I mean, politically, if it wasn't on, it wasn't there already, it might not be created. But the ICC, as I said, uh, would still exist. These countries that have prosecuted, third countries that are prosecuting, uh, would still be prosecuting, and there and and. Uh, Prosecution doesn't that can't be influenced by these sort of political decisions under countries that respect the rule of law. So those cases go forward, and so as I said, uh, there could be a negotiation with 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 Russia, uh, but the ICC warrant uh, that currently exists would 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 still be there, and Putin would say get rid of it, and the ICC would say we don't have a way to get rid of it. The UN General Assembly or Security Council could uh, suspend it for a year at a time. Uh, that's been asked in other conflicts and situations, but it's always been rejected by, by the UN. And there's always the countries that we don't want to do that, but that's going to lead to more. And so even and that's only a year at a time. So I think that even if there is peace, the justice that's proceeding now will will continue, and and there will be consequences, and these individuals will be will will be held to 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 account. Uh, go on to I mean obviously in Bosnia you've got a peace under Dayton, and there's still you know there's still prosecutions going on went on in the hague and also in in, in sarajevo so you know it's it, the, the justice will happen in, in terms of the politics uh i mean i the, one of the very positive things that happened uh, uh during the conflict in the u.s politics was that congress voted unanimously to basically support the icc which the u.s had been against before under trump in particular even sanctioned the prosecutor of the icc um 
um, they had never, and he says, enjoying the ICC, but when, because of what Russia is doing in Ukraine, because of the strong support for that, Congress unanimously said, support the ICC and pursue and assist that case and pursue and assist justice in the Ukrainian system and elsewhere. And the United States has already put on an arrest warrant uh, uh, or, you know, cases where an American is, uh, uh, was, was victimized in, in Ukraine. So I think no matter who is president, those cases will continue and the support for justice in this situation will continue. Okay, uh, Ambassador Arap, um, thank you for this tour de force. Thank you for your candid uh, um, and extremely detailed um, uh, discourse, the uh, the expose, and uh, you've led us through so many different cases. Uh, so if, you, if we have to draw the bottom line for, for tonight's discussion and, and this session, it's... Um, Crimes of justice are crimes of leadership, you know, not, and the Russian uh, chain of command, be it political, military, all the propaganda, the information warfare front, let's put it this way, will all be held accountable if, of course, we were able to get a hold of them. Uh, suing for, for, for peace will not help them, will not avail them to, to uh, evade justice. Uh, and ultimately, these are universal values. There is a universal, there is a universal norms that must be upheld regarding who is the president uh, in America. So I think this recapit recapitulates as well. Once again, thank you for your time. I, I know you're facing this long trip and long voyage across the globe. So if you have some final words to add to our, to say to our Ukrainian audi audience, so please go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for that excellent summary. Uh, let's just say as, as my title that uh, it's it's absolutely necessary there be justice for the crimes committed against uh, against Ukraine and for the benefit of the victims and survivors in Ukraine uh, for the future of Ukraine, but really for the future of the world. Because if uh, if there's not justice in this situation, no one is safe anywhere. Absolutely, and Stephen, uh, I see all those uh, applauses flying, all those cards and thumbs up. So I know you've been already to to our campus. Uh, you have so many friends. Uh, here uh, with, in Kiev, but also within the walls of our university. It will be a pleasure for us to host you once again in person uh, next time when you're when you're very, when you're in, in Ukraine. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. See you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.